think that you are all here on the basis of false pretense that the event is really a humbug. <laughs> and I am drawing on what I might call the Scott McClellan syndrome. <laughs> 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 that our book, when you read it, contains no secrets. It only confirms what everybody knew. And it's filled with, how can I say it in its most banal form, filled with cliches. <laughs> <laughs> and I give you a demonstration. In 1970, one of our characters that we write about, Miles Copeland, Miles Copeland was the first CIA agent to bring about a regime change, which he did in 1949 in Syria, bringing in a colonel who reigned for six months, was then deposed, setting off a firecracker change of coups and counter coups, ultimately culminating with the Assad dynasty that we live with now. <laughs> now, in 1970, Copeland wrote a book called The Game of Nations. The subtitle, and he got it through the CIA, I don't know how he did it, was uh, The Amorality of Great Power Politics. And in his book, he says, and here's where I come to the Scott McClellan thing, cliches. He said, first of all, that you should not try to bring about a regime change unless there was an indigenous opposition force in the country that you could work with. And that you try to, if, if you must change, let me read what he says, if you must change either the character or the course of another government, you must do it by forces already existing inside his italics, the country. If no such active or dormant forces exist, you must try another approach or simply adjust to an imperfect world. <laughs> <laughs> he then goes on to say that we shouldn't expect gratitude from the peoples that we help. He said, we must recognize that most of our best work for the government we wish to remain in power must be secret, not because we need the secrecy, but because our client does. No, Virginia, we are not popular, not italicized, in most parts of the world. Leaders in countries which receive our largesse, our largesse do not gain in the eyes of their peoples from advertising their friendship with us, although too many of them, from time to time, win a few points by boasting about how they have made suckers of us. <laughs> in all but a few instances where regional leaders have become known as pro-American, they have lost prestige or their lives as a result. Then he goes on to say, and I thought this was you know, quite an astonishing insight, uh, 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 given that he was writing in 1970 at the beginning uh, 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 of, the, of, the, of, of the, the morass that we are now embedded in, uh, that he said that we should not think that free elections are a sovereign cure to all our ills. He says, very often what happens in an election is you have one of two outcomes. One, an election of someone who then becomes the last person to hold an election, and he's a dictator forever. <laughs> or, he said, a demagogue making promises he can't possibly keep, and who, after victory, will make demands on us we can't possibly meet, and then blame us for the failure. Bravo. And, you know, when I read this, uh, this is Scott McClellan. <laughs> you know, what's new here? And I apologize to all of you for perpetrating a book which uh, there was a, a famous anecdote about um, a young man who went to see Hamlet and someone asked him, how did he like Hamlet? And he said, well, it was okay, but it was full of cliches. <laughs> <laughs>